Welcome back. Today's talk is probably the hardest of them. It will deal with some ideas and concepts that you may find difficult to follow at first. Uh, this is not surprising. We've evolved and our daily experience has all been on a small planet, which for most of our history has been all that we have really known. It is not a given that we should be able to understand things totally outside of our own experience. So remember, it's taken humankind centuries to reach the understanding that we currently have. You should not necessarily expect to follow it all in the course of an hour's lecture. I've followed an historical approach with this talk so that you can see how our ideas have changed through time and how we have progressed to our current thinking. Cosmology. Most sciences are experimental, but astronomy is an observational science. The part of astronomy that studies the beginning and evolution of the universe is called cosmology. We certainly can't experiment with this, but how can we observe it? Well, in this talk we'll discuss how astronomers came to our current understanding of the universe and how it is as it is. On the way, we'll need to consider gravitation, light, Einstein's theories of relativity, our modern observations, and finally, what we don't know. Because cosmology looks at the universe in general, um, I'm not going to deal with fiddling small details, like the Earth, or even the Sun. Mostly the smallest objects that we are interested in here are galaxies. So, the image that we're looking at here is part of the sky about a tenth the diameter of the full moon, and it was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and contains somewhere around 10,000 galaxies. So, let me just remind you, that the Earth and the star we, that it goes around, the Sun, are part of a galaxy that we call the Milky Way. And if we could travel outside of the Milky Way, we'd see something that looks a bit like this. So here you're looking at about what, 100 to 400 billion stars, of which the Sun is one of them. This picture also shows actually part of the galactic coordinate system used by astronomers and also the distances measured in light years. Remember from the first talk, the distance light travelling at 300,000 kilometres per second goes in one year, about 10 trillion kilometres. The Sun is about 26,000 light years from the centre, takes around 240 million years to orbit once round, and the galaxy is well over 100,000 light years across. At a dark site, you can just see the closest large galaxy to us as a faint smudge of light. And this is the Andromeda Galaxy, or M31. It's broadly similar to our own, a bit bigger. The light you would see from this galaxy left two and a half million years ago. That's ten times longer than the time that Homo sapiens has existed as a species. So we're seeing M31 as it was two and a half million years ago. So the further we look in distance, the farther back in time we see. Now it might appear that M31 is a long way off, but astronomers regard it as being close by. It's part of our local group of galaxies. The light from the most distant objects so far det detected has taken about 13.4 billion years to get to us. OK, so we know the universe is very large, but what else do we know about it? Well, our understanding of the universe took a great leap forward in the 17th century. In fact, it was probably then that could be regarded as the beginning of modern cosmology. And it starts with this man, Isaac Newton. We met him before in regard to the splitting of sunlight with a prism into different colours. Well, Newton was born towards the end of 1642, and 
It was he that provided the theory underlying the motions of the planets, and Newton, in fact, did most of his original thinking in the plague years of 1665 and 1666. And in fact, by 1666, he computed the moon's orbit. But being Newton, he published nothing. He was secretive, he was argumentative, he'd already had big arguments with Robert Hooke about optics. Well, 18 years later, in 1684, there was a bit of an argument between Christopher Wren, probably better known as architect, but he was actually an astronomer too, Robert Hooke and Edmund Halley, that's Halley of Comet fame. And they were having a discussion about the motion of the planets. And the question arose how the planets would move if the force holding them to the sun varied as the inverse square of the distance from each planet to the sun. And as a result of this, Halley came to consult with Newton then at Cambridge. And Halley asked him, asked Newton, what he thought the curve would be that would be described by the planets supposing the force of attraction towards the sun to be the reciprocal of the square of their distance from it. Sir Isaac replied immediately that it would be an ellipsis. The doctor, that's Halley, struck with joy and amazement, asked him how he knew it. Why, saith he, I have calculated it. Whereupon, Dr. Halley asked him for his calculation without any further delay. Well, Sir Isaac rummaged around on his desk and looked among his papers, but couldn't find it. But he promised Halley that he'd renew it and then send it to him. Well, it took three years, with much wheedling from Halley. But the result was this. Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, or Principia for short. And it's obvious, looking at this book, the vast mathematical difficulties that Newton actually had to overcome. In his initial calculation of the Moon's motion, he made all sorts of assumptions, which in effect he now had to justify. And this picture actually shows Newton's copy of the first edition with his own annotations on it, ready for the second edition. Now, in Principia, Newton described his theory geometrically. But in modern terms, the essence of this is this equation. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it. I'll add some details to it. And this explains how the force between two bodies of mass M1 and M2 varies with the distance between the two bodies. And in effect, it's the mass of the first one times the mass of the second one divided by the square of the distance between them. That's the distance between them times itself. All times some constant. And that is a measure of the force. So, if you double one of the masses, the force goes up by a factor of two. If, however, you double the distance, the force goes down by a factor of four. The value of the gravitational constant is actually quite difficult to measure because it's very small. So the force of gravity is actually very small, but it dominates the universe because on the whole the masses involved are so large. Newton's theory of gravitation, the attraction between the Sun and the planets, and in fact between any two bodies, was phenomenally successful. It could explain the motions of pretty well everything in the solar system. But it does have a weak point. Suppose we want to measure the gravitational attraction between our Milky Way galaxy and, say, the Andromeda galaxy, M31, at some particular time. But whose time? Look at a clock on M31 from here, and it'll be two and a half million years behind ours. What's the distance between us? Is it as it is now? Or when the light left the Andromeda galaxy? 
اوبوت In effect, Newton's theory assumes that there is some sort of absolute space and time, the equivalent of a universal reference frame, like some universe-spanning set of rulers and clocks to measure things with. And in fact, Leibniz on the continent pointed this weakness out, but it was ignored because of the success of the theory. And Newton didn't get on with Leibniz anyway, they'd already fallen out about who invented what is now known as the calculus. All right, so Newton's theory of gravity reigns supreme, at least for the moment. Let's move on. And we're moving on to the second half of the 19th century. And this is the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell probably of his time the scientist that had the greatest effect on 20th century physics. And Maxwell had formulated a set of equations that described electricity and magnetism and their interactions. And in essence these link electricity and magnetism together describing how the one can create the other. And for your delectation here they are in a modern formulation. It's hard to describe, um, but to a physicist these are beautiful. Now the next clever bit is that Maxwell discovered that if he combined these equations then he found that the result of that combination was that he ended up with an equation which described a wave. And it was a self-propagating electromagnetic wave. And he could predict from these equations how fast that wave would be travelling. And it depends purely on the values of mu naught and epsilon naught, which are constants. They're constants we can measure. And if you plug in the measured values for these constants, he discovered that the speed that this wave was travelling C was about 300,000 kilometers per second, which you may remember is the same as the measured speed for light. In effect, what Maxwell had done here, he has predicted the existence of light, or in more general electromagnetic waves, from first principles. The question that then arose was, OK, what's the medium through which this electromagnetic wave, through which light, propagates? Sound goes through air by compressing and rarefying the air. Um, waves in water travel through the water. They sort of wobble it up and down. But what about light? What's the medium that light needs to travel through? Well, the solution at the time was something called the ether. And this was a mysterious substance through which light through which light propagated. And it had another advantage as well. Maxwell's equations show that light propagates at a constant speed. But relative to what? Presumably the ether. In which case the ether would also do as this absolute reference frame that Newton's theory required. It pervades the entire universe. And we can measure everything relative to, relative to it, and everything is hunky-dory. Right, so we have the ether. Now, wouldn't it be interesting then to see how fast the Earth is moving through it? Well, this was done by a couple of physicists called Albert Michelson and Edward Morley. And their experiment, shown here, mounted on a big block of concrete floating on a bath of mercury so it could be turned round. And it compared the speed of light in two paths at right angles to each other. And think about it, if the Earth is moving through the ether, then there ought to be a difference between the measured speed of light in these two paths. Because in general, the Earth's motion through the ether would add to the speed of light in one of the paths more than it does the other. Okay? And they carried out this experiment in 1881 and again more accurately in 1887, and sort of diagrammatically 
uh, it looks like this. It had a light source and a semi-silvered mirror. And this reflected some of the light in one path up there. And some of it went through and got reflected off a mirror here and back again. OK, so the light goes there, back down to where you observe it, and from there and back down to where you observe it. But if you think if the Earth is moving, say, in this direction, OK, then the distance that the light has to travel here is different from the distance the light has to travel here to when you observe it. And so you can actually measure that difference by a process known as interference between the light. Well, what were the results? However they turned the apparatus, the two waves always arrived back at the time, back at their observational point at the same time. They failed to detect any difference at all between the two paths. So where does this leave us? It means that either the Earth is at rest relative to the ether, which is a bit like going back to the Earth as the centre of the universe, or, as another great thinker suggested, there is no such thing as the ether. Light is perfectly capable of propagating itself without the need for a medium. It follows that there is no universal reference frame. Differently moving observers will measure different distances and times. In fact, the only thing that we'll all agree on is the speed of light. And the man who did all this was Albert Einstein. Now, just think about the idea that all observers will measure the same speed for light. Suppose I shine a torch at you while you are moving towards me at near the speed of light. What would you measure the speed of light to be in that beam? In practice, according to Einstein, you would still get the same speed of light as if, I was, as if you were stationary. You would not get an answer of almost twice the speed of light. Now, if cars behaved in this way, then two cars, each moving at 30 miles an hour according to their speedometers and approaching one another, would have a closing speed of 30 miles an hour, not 60 as we would expect. Now the constancy of the speed of light has serious consequences, and let's just look at one of them. Put your thinking caps on. This fine representation of a rocket is moving along, say. And you are, you, here you are, an observer on it. And you're going to let off some flash of light. From, And you are positioned exactly in the middle of the rocket. And so the light from this rocket is going to reach both ends of the rocket at the same time. Because you're in the middle. Okay, And that will happen whether it's moving or not. Now, we can plot when this happens on a time and distance thing. And we say, there's that event, the light reaching that end of the rocket, and here's that event, the light reaching that end of the rocket, and they happen at the same time, but at different places. Now, suppose we do the same experiment, but we put the observer on the ground, watching the rocket go by. So the rocket is now moving. And for the sake of argument, I'm moving about an eighth the speed of light. Now what's going to happen, as seen from the ground? As seen from the ground, the back of the rocket is moving towards your light source. Your flash of light and the front of the rocket is moving away from it. So the light reaching the back of the rocket will happen before the light reaches the front of the rocket. So these two events, the light reaching the ends of the rocket, now happened not only at different places, but at different times, as seen by an observer on the ground. So events that are simultaneous to an observer 
on the rocket are not simultaneous to an observer on the ground. So we can ask ourselves which observer's viewpoint is correct. And of course, they're both correct. But what each observer sees depends how they are moving, how the object is moving that they're looking at, how they are moving relative to each other. The other thing that this shows us is that in effect time and distance have become mixed together. The only thing that is the same in these experiments, only two things actually that are the same in these experiments, are the speed of light and the value of this interval here. That is the same as that. But in the one case, the interval is purely distance-wise. The interval is just between the two ends of the rocket. And in this case, it's both the two ends of the rocket and a difference in time as well. So we've mixed distance and time together. OK, you say, if that's the same as the other one, how's that so? Because they don't look the same. Well, the reason is that the rocket, as seen from somebody on the ground, appears a bit shorter than it would if it was stationary with respect to you. And that's one of the consequences. All of these are the consequences of saying that the speed of light is constant, however the observers are moving. The other thing that actually happens to the rocket is that its mass gets larger again, as considered by somebody on the ground. And in fact, in this example, the rock, in terms of distance, the rocket appears about three quarters of a percent shorter to the observer on the ground. Now, all of this Einstein put together in what is now known as his special theory of relativity. Another consequence of special relativity is this famous equation, and it equates mass and energy. Um, this describes how we get energy out of the nuclear reactions going on in the sun. Remember, the sun loses mass, which is turned into energy in accordance with this equation. The sun is losing 5 million tonnes every second, and that's been turned into energy. Okay, And because c here, the speed of light, is very large, you see, in principle, we can get an awful lot of energy out of a relatively small amount of mass. We just need to work out how to actually do it. So, for now, though, I just want you to remember that you can regard mass and energy, in principle, as interchangeable. But special relativity has a limitation. It only deals with objects moving at a constant speed. There's no acceleration dealt with, no acceleration allowed in it. Now, to a physicist, acceleration isn't just changing speed, it also means changing direction. Change speed or change direction, you accelerate. So, technically, a change in your velocity. And that means an observer who is accelerating could not use special relativity. As you stand on the Earth, you are accelerating. The Earth is constantly changing direction as it revolves on its own axis and orbits around the Sun. So, clearly a more general theory was required. Something that can handle acceleration as well. And, once again, this was Einstein. And Einstein realised here that gravity is indistinguishable from an acceleration. If we put you in a box and drop you, you cannot, in principle, differentiate between being in a gravitational field and just accelerating. And so, as far as Einstein is concerned, gravity is indistinguishable from acceleration, and starting from that premise, he produced his general theory of relativity ten years later. And because of that link between acceleration and gravity, Einstein's general theory is also a theory of gravity. 
the limitations of Newton's theory were at last exposed. Now, the maths are actually complicated. Even Einstein found it hard. I'll try and give you a flavour though. Don't try and understand these symbols. They're just there so you have something to look at. What is important is what this means physically and I'll explain that. In essence, what Einstein has done here is said that matter and therefore energy, matter and energy, actually bends space-time. So space-time isn't necessarily flat. If there's any matter or any energy around, it could be curved. You are all sitting in your own little dimples in space-time. Get somebody to shine a light beam past you and it looks like it goes in a straight line, but actually it's wobbling, being ever so slightly bent by your masses. Not very much, because you haven't got a very large mass. But try this with the Sun, or an entire galaxy, and we can actually measure that bending. And that's just what an expedition led by Arthur Eddington, the same who hypothesised about helium being formed from hydrogen in stars, and he did that during the total solar eclipse of 1919. And here's a photographic negative from that expedition. And it was taken on the west coast of Africa. Now, some of these stars, and you can see here's the sun, and there's the sun's corona during the eclipse, and what we've marked here with these bars are some stars. And you can measure the positions of these stars on this plate, and you notice that the light from these stars is passing close to the sun. So according to Einstein's theory, it will be bent, and that means the position of the star will change, or appear to change. You can then repeat the observation when the sun isn't there, and look at the positions of the stars then, and hence work out how far those, the sun has bent the light coming from those stars. Okay, and the amount that the, that the light was bent was consistent with what Einstein's theory predicted. Here's a more recent image. All we want to do is look at this. This is actually a luminous red galaxy and its light has been bent into a ring from a more distant blue as luminous red galaxy here and it's and the light of a more distant blue galaxy behind it has been bent into a ring and so the mass in this galaxy here is bending the light from a galaxy behind this into almost a complete circle and fittingly things like this are called Einstein rings now those equations which I showed you for, for Einstein's theory, are in general called the field equations. And solutions of those equations in general predict a curved space-time. And also, in general, they predict a universe which is either expanding or contracting. But when Einstein derived those equations in 1916, it was thought that the universe was static. It was not expanding or contracting. And so alarmed, he introduced an additional term into his equations. The lambda term, as it became known. And he was allowed to do this for those mathematically inclined because this is a constant of integration. And in effect, it was a sort of, it produced something which acted against gravity, the sort of opposite of gravity. And the idea was that it could balance out the gravitational 
attraction of everything in the universe which will try and pull it together to make it contract and it will balance it out so as to hold the universe static so it's like a sort of force of, of cosmic repulsion now unfortunately this didn't really work very well first the result is unstable obviously you, you need a very very fine balance and um, one movement one way or the other and the universe will then either start contracting or expanding and the other reason it wasn't very successful is because a few years later it was discovered that the universe was, in fact, expanding. Einstein described this as the biggest mistake of my life, and for a long time, lambda was simply set to zero. And ignored. So, the universe is expanding, but how was that discovered? Well, it's time to return to the observations. In 1963, the cos cosmology, the study of the origin and evolution of the universe, was described as only having two and a half known facts. And in fact, cosmology theories were often criticised for being largely untestable, the origin of the universe uh, having obviously happened out of our reach. But even though we can't see the origin itself, there are actually a lot of observations that we do have, some more obvious than others, and now we have considerably more than two and a half known facts. Probably the most important is distance. But I'm not going to describe how distances are measured just yet. Instead, I'm going to talk about how fast things are moving. We can measure how fast things are moving away from or towards us by using something called the Doppler effect. Now, when we talked about exoplanets, I mentioned the Doppler effect. You can use it to see how fast a star is wobbling towards and away from us. And I said the same thing happens um, with sound. Listen to this. Now, you've just listened to a car passing you, standing at the side of the road, whilst blowing its horn. And did you notice a change in pitch as it passed? And you probably heard the same effect with a police or an ambulance siren. So, whilst the car was coming towards us, the pitch of its horn was higher. But this changed to lower when it passed and started travelling away from us. And we could, in fact, have used that change in pitch to calculate the speed of the car. Well, so same thing happens with light. If a star is moving towards us, then its pitch is increased, which for light means its colour. So a star moving towards us looks bluer than it would otherwise. If it's moving away from us, then it looks redder than it would otherwise. And in a star spectrum, these shift the absorption lines in the spectrum towards smaller or larger wavelengths. We can then use that shift to calculate how fast the star is moving towards or away from us. Now I've exaggerated the colour shift here obviously to make the point. And the same applies not just to stars but to whole galaxies. And in 1929 the uh, American astronomer Edwin Hubble was observing the spectra of whole galaxies, remember made up of the individual spectra of those stars, and he found something very interesting. All of the galaxies beyond our local group displayed redshifts. In other words, they were receding from us. And he managed to obtain a measure of the distances of these galaxies, and he found the following relationship. So, here is how fast the galaxy is moving away from us in kilometres per second. And here is a measure of the distance which you took from the magnitude of the brightest galaxy in the cluster. And you'll notice there's a straight line. The further away something is, the faster it is moving. Double its distance and it's going away twice as fast. 
And in fact, from general relativity, a Belgian astronomer, Georges Lemaitre, had actually previously suggested that such a relationship would exist if the universe was expanding. And this law, this linear relationship here, can be again expressed mathematically as the Hubble-Lemaitre law, that the speed of recession is some constant, now known as Hubble's constant, times the distance. And Hubble's constant is important because it fixes the age of the universe. The larger it is, the younger is the universe, the smaller it is, the older. Now, it's important not to think of our galaxy as being in a special place because all the others appear to recede from it. Let me show you some pictures of a little demonstration. Here's a universe, a blue balloon with some yellow galaxies on it. And think of the blue balloon as being space-time. And I'm going to expand it, blow up the balloon a bit. But I want you to imagine that you are on one of those yellow dots, one of those galaxies. It doesn't matter which. right? And that you are watching all of the other dots. How do they appear to move as the balloon is blown up? The dots, galaxies, have all got further apart from each other. And whichever dot you decided to sit on, all of the others would appear to be moving away from you. And what's more, the ones that are further away will be moving away faster because there's more balloon to stretch between you and those dots. So, for the universe, it is space itself that's expanding, not galaxies expanding into already existing empty space. So if all the galaxies are receding from one another, they must all have been in one place in the past, precise around 14 billion years ago, depending on the current value, depending on the value of Hubble's constant. So winding the universe backwards from today, we can speculate that the distant past is once in a very hot and very small and dense state, which then sort of exploded, for want of a better term, and started the expansion. And it's that which is now known as the Big Bang Theory. Do you remember when I talked about stars and their colours? Cool stars are red, for example. Um, slightly hotter stars are orange. Um, hotter still stars are yellow, uh, then white. And then very hot stars are sort of blue. Keep on with hotter and hotter stars, and they will then emit ultraviolet radiation, and then X rays, and then gamma rays. We can't call all of these light because we can't see them all, so they're called electromagnetic radiation. Remember Maxwell's equations. The hotter something is, the higher the frequency or the shorter the wavelength of the radiation that it emits. And electromagnetic waves cover everything from gamma rays through to light to radio waves and so on, and they differ only in their wavelength or frequency. So when the universe was very hot, just after the Big Bang, it would have emitted gamma rays. On this picture of the magnetic spectrum up here. At an equivalent temperature of sort of billions of degrees. But as the universe expands, it cools, and so the radiation emitted by it will come down and down and down and down and down here as the universe cools. Okay, emitting longer and longer, longer wavelength electromagnetic radiation. And today the universe has obviously cooled a lot, so the radiation would actually be in the microwave region, sort of radio waves down, down in this sort of area. So if there's a Big Bang, we could expect to be able to detect a faint microwave radiation from all over the sky, the remnant of the Big Bang. And in 1965, Penzias and Wilson did just that, albeit accidentally. Now, they were experimenting with this antenna. It's called a horn antenna. And it was originally built to detect radio 
signal echoes from the echo balloon satellites, sort of early communications satellite. And they were left with the residual signal, even after they cleaned out all the pigeon droppings out of the horn. And it was a hundred times higher than they expected for just the noise from their receiver. And it was uniform over the whole sky. Wherever they pointed this horn, they got the same signal. And in effect, what Penders and Wilson had discovered was the afterglow of the Big Bang at an equivalent temperature of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. They had discovered what is now known as the cosmic microwave background. Well, I'll return to that, to the cosmic microwave background, and what it can tell us later. So let's take the Big Bang as proven, and the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, is a pretty good proof for it. And let's look where the universe is going. The future. So we know the universe is expanding, Will it ever stop? Well, that depends on two things, speed of its expansion and the amount of matter or energy in it. If you've got matter and energy, then in effect they have a gravitational field and a gravitational field will try and pull things in again. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is, is there sufficient matter, is there sufficient gravity to ultimately halt the expansion and then maybe start the universe contracting again after that. Well, if it's expanding very fast or there isn't much matter, then it will never stop. If it had a lot of matter, then it might eventually stop and start contracting. And in between, there's a sort of area where it will just keep on expanding. And so all of this depends on the average density of matter in the universe, how much material there is in some arbitrary volume of space in the universe, on average. And the average density of matter required to just halt the expansion is called the critical density. And I'm going to introduce a parameter called omega, appropriately enough. And omega is the actual density of matter in the universe divided by this critical density, the amount of matter or the density just required in order to halt the expansion, or not quite halt the expansion. Okay. So if the actual density was equal to the critical density, omega would have the value 1. If omega is less than 1, then the actual density is too small and so the universe will keep on expanding forever. If omega is greater than 1, then the expansion ought to eventually stop and we start getting a contraction. And in case you're wondering, the critical density here is equivalent to about 5 atoms per cubic metre of space. That's about a brick in a cubic light year. So it's not a huge amount. So let's have a look how the universe expands for different values of omega. And here's how it goes. Here's size relative to what it is now. And here's time in thousands and millions of years, with naught being now. So if omega is, say, a half, the universe will keep on expanding and expanding and expanding forever. If omega is one and a half, it will eventually reach some maximum size and then start contracting. And if omega equals 1, it will continue expanding, but only just. Now, omega, as I said, depends on the matter density of the universe. And for, remember, from general relativity, the matter density of the universe also shapes space-time. So omega also fixes the shape of space-time. So for omega greater than 1, space is curved but closed, like the surface of a sphere. For omega less than 1, space is curved again but open, it goes on forever. And for omega equals 1, space is flat. Now we've drawn some triangles on these because it's only in this case 
that the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, which is what you may remember being taught at school. In all other cases, they do not add up to 180 degrees. There could be more, they could be less. Now, in fact, there are very good theoretical reasons to prefer omega equals 1, a flat space-time. Very shortly after the Big Bang, and not much less than a second, much, much, much less than a second after, it's thought, it is thought the universe had a very rapid period of expansion, and there are theoretical reasons for this, that increased its size by a factor of 10 to the power of 50. That's 1 followed by 50 zeros. And this is appropriately dubbed inflation. And its effect will be to actually smooth out any slight curvature that you might have. So it's practically flat. I mean, think about blowing up a balloon again. As you start small and blow it up and up and up and up more and more and more, the actual surface here, the curvature of that surface gets less and less and less. And you blow it up, blow it up by 10 to the power 50, it's going to be so near flat you won't be able to tell the difference. Same sort of thing for the universe. All right, so what is the average density of the actual universe? Surely we could just tot up all the stars and gas and galaxies and whatnot in some region of space and divide by its volume. Well, it's slightly more complicated than that. For a start, there's dust. Dust is dark, and we only see it if it's in front of something bright. Good example, horse head nebula. What you've actually got here is dust. Bright background, dust showing up against it. Another good one, NGC 891, galaxy. This big dark band here, dust. Another one, Centaurus A, NGC 5281, dust. Dust's everywhere. So we need to allow for dust and we can add it all together. And what do we get? Well, wait for it. Hmm. Omega is 0 0.04. I now added an M subscript here to indicate that this is for matter that we can see. Hmm. We're clearly a long way from 1. Um, 0 0.04 is equivalent to about 0 0.2 atoms per cubic metre, whereas we need at least 5. So, according to this, at least the universe will keep on expanding forever. But wait. There is more. Here is the rotational speeds of stars and gas in a galaxy called M33. And it's plotted against distance from the center. So here's how fast things are rotating around the center of the galaxy. And this is the distance in thousands of light years from the center of the galaxy. And we can calculate what we'd expect based on the amount of visible matter and all the stars and stuff in this galaxy, and it ought to go like this. But this is what we measure. And you'll notice it's dramatically different. In order to get the observed measurements, we need there to be a lot more matter in that galaxy than we are actually seeing and it needs to be spread out in a sort of halo around the observed stars and the gas. Another one. Let's have a look at some clusters of galaxies. This is part of the Virgo cluster. There's something odd going on as well. We can see how these galaxies are moving. We can measure that. And if there's the, only the amount of matter that we can see in this cluster then they all ought to be flying apart, but they aren't. Again, we're missing something. In fact, we need five to ten times more matter than we are seeing to hold these galaxies together, to stop them moving all apart. There is some sort of so-called dark matter that must be present, but it's invisible to us. Now, there are actually other more direct methods of detecting its presence as well, 
and one is by how it bends light passing through it. It's dark matter, it's got mass, therefore it bends light. And this is the 2017 results from the so-called Dark Energy Survey. And this represents a present-day structure of the universe. So, again, this is results from what's called lensing measurements, how light is bent by matter that is out there. And it's based on lensing measurements of 26 million galaxies. And we can see that there's all sorts of stuff. Right in this sort of, mm, it's a bit like a sort of sponge or something in three dimensions. So from surveys like this, we can estimate the amount of this dark matter, even though we don't know what it is, and add it onto omega. And we get 0.27 at the most. Well, that's kind of better, but we're still quite a way off one. So is omega really well below 1? Or are we missing something? Are there any other ways we can get at its value? Well, yes, there are. Let's go back to how the size of the universe varies with time, this graph. So, different values of omega, time, size of the universe. Now, can you see how the shape of the curve depends on omega? We have different curvature depending on the value of omega. And the shape indicates the rate of the expansion. So in principle, all we need to do is to measure the rate of expansion. And that should tell us. Um, but there's a catch. Because we are here. And as you can see, all of the curves here look much the same. We need to be a lot much further into the future in order to work out anything from the shape of the curve. Now, we can't go into the future, but we can go into the past. And we can go into the past because, remember, light takes a long time to reach us. So if we look at more distant objects, we are in fact looking into the past. We're looking as to how those objects were in the past further back, the better. So we need two things to get the shape of the curve. The speed at which objects are moving and their distance. Speed's easy. Redshift. Right? Distance. Distance is a bit more tricky. Now I've been put off telling how we measure distance, but I can't do it any longer. Well, we have no reliable means of obtaining the distance of objects so far away unless they all have the same absolute brightness. If they're all the same brightness, all the same luminosity, then we can use their apparent brightness, how bright they appear to us, a long way off, as a measure of their distance. So in fact what we need is what astronomers call a standard candle. And, fortunately, there is one. Certain stars in double systems can, late in their life, explode. And for a sh few short days, the star can outshine an entire galaxy. And this sort of explosion is called a Type 1a supernova. It's not the same as the supernova I was, I was describing during stellar evolution. So here is a Type 1a supernova. SN 2011 FE in the galaxy M101. And we can see here's before and here's the supernova. And in fact, this particular supernova was observed in August 2011, conveniently during an astronomy week at Burton Bradstock. Now, M101 is a relatively nearby galaxy, only 21 million light years away. And so we could actually see this supernova th even through my telescope. Now, as it happens, these supernova make good standard candles. They're very bright, so they're visible at immense distances. And the conditions that produce them are relatively standardised. 
so they all tend to reach the same maximum brightness. And what is more, we can tell that it's a type 1a supernova from the shape of their light curves, how their light output varies with time and from their spectra. And here's the light curves for that supernova. So this is time, Julian days. And here's the brightness of the light in different colours of light. And you can see it reaches a peak quite rapidly, falls off, and there's a sort of kink, and then it falls off much more gradually. And this is characteristic of this type of supernova. So we know how intrinsically bright the supernova is, we know how bright it appears to us, and so we can work out its distance. We know how fast it's moving away from us, from its redshift, and so we have a handle on the expansion rate of the universe at the time that the light left that star. And all the results from the first of these that were done in 1998 have shown the same thing. The universe was expanding more slowly in the past than it is now. And that means, far from slowing down, it is accelerating. Oh dear, this was unexpected. It was just at this point that Einstein's lambda term makes a spectacular comeback because a force of cosmical repulsion, which is in effect what it is, was just what's required to produce an accelerating universe. But for now, I'm going to return to the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is in fact very uniform, so it's much the same wherever you look at it on the sky. It has much the same equivalent temperature. But it's not totally uniform. There are very small fluctuations in its temperature of order parts per million, so they're really tiny. And in fact, if your eyes were sensitive to these, this is the sort of thing you would see. And this is over Antarctica, it's the boomerang experiment. So you'd see this very sort of patch sky with these tiny little fluctuations going on. And over the whole sky, these look something like this. These are from the Planck satellite 2018. And it turns out that the sort of size scale of these variations, these are hotter, these are cooler, it turns out the size scale of these variations in temperature are really quite sensitive to the value of our critical density parameter, omega. Now, typically, the scale size of these variations is about two degrees across. That's about four times the apparent size of the moon. But if the universe had a very low density, if omega was very much less than one, the scale would be about half of this size. So we'd expect them to be only one degree across. So you can see how the shape of the universe, and so omega, changes the appearance of the cosmic microwave background. Small scale skies, medium scale size for flat, and a large scale size for closed. Okay, for omega greater than one. Now, the power in the temperature variations of various sizes tells us a lot more. Now, this, if you like, is a sort of histogram of the size scale. So, most of the size scale variation around about here at the sort of one two degrees type of type of size okay so there's a lot of power in those but you get sort of little bumps at different size scales and down here not very much these are very large angular size scale obviously 90 degrees sort of sort of quarter way around the sky now the the red dots are observations OK, and the green line is a theoretical model. And it's called the Lambda Cold Dark Matter 
model. And this assumes that this dark matter that we don't know what it is, is what is termed cold. That is, it's not moving very fast. OK, and lambda is that lambda term in Einstein's equations. So this assumes that lambda has some value and that dark matter is cold. And you'll see that actually it's a pretty good fit to the observations. And these imply that omega actually has a value very close to 1. But if you remember, the best we got before was 0 0.27, quarter of that. So what are we missing? Well, we've forgotten that lambda. Here's that lambda again. And what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to shove lambda here over to this side of the equation. And we now have a term here on the mass energy side of the equation. And so lambda is in fact giving us the equivalent of some sort of energy or mass, depending how you look at it. And it's called the vacuum energy, the energy that's there in the vacuum of space. And so a non-zero lambda, as I said, is equivalent to an energy, and energy is equivalent to mass, and if it's mass, then it contributes towards omega. In other words, we need to add on to our value for omega m a contribution from this so-called dark energy term. So in fact, we need omega equals omega m, which is what we've so far managed to observe, including this mysterious dark matter, plus the stuff from the vacuum energy from this lambda term. All right, so what are these values? Well, these are results of various observations of omega lambda, from this mysterious stuff which we now call dark energy and from this dark matter. And various experiments, various sets of observations constrain these in different ways. Cosmic microwave background constraints to be here, supernova put them here, measurements of clusters of galaxies puts them here, and you'll notice that they all tend to agree somewhere around here. So omega lambda is up here at the sort of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 region and omega m is around about 0.4 or so on that basis. So it's in ways like this that we can try and deduce the values of these basic parameters of the universe and if we just use the measurements from the cosmic wave background we actually obtain the following. Omega lambda is about going on for 0.7, the dark matter density is about 0.3. The baryonic matter density, which is basically everything else, us, the sun, stars, everything that we can see, is actually only about 0 0.05. It's tiny. Hubble's constant is 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and that gives an age of the universe is just short of 13.8 billion years. So we can now say what the universe is made of from these three. Um, most of it, three quarters or so, almost three quarters, is dark energy. Cold dark matter makes up around 26%. And normal atoms, us and everything that we can normally see, is just short of 5%. So we are less than a twentieth of what there is out there in the universe. Now it's interesting just to pause here and look back at how our perceptions have changed. For a long time it was thought that the Earth was the centre of the universe, as it was then known, and that all else turned around it. Then it was realised that actually we orbit the Sun, and then that the Sun wasn't the centre of the universe either, but that was just an ordinary star. And then that our galaxy was only one of billions and now that the sort of stuff that we and everything that we see is made up of only one twentieth of the entire universe. So let's add in this contribution from dark energy and see what that means to the, how the universe is going to expand. These have slightly different values, but it's still much the same. 
So here we go. If lambda is equal to zero, we go like this. But now here we've got this ex this acceleration going on. Yep, it is expanding faster and faster and faster. So the universe has the critical density. If you add all those values of omega together, you get one. And space is therefore flat, but the dark energy causes expansion to accelerate and it will go on expanding faster and faster. So what might happen? Well, that depends what happens to lambda. The lambda term, what is this dark energy? Does that get smaller or bigger? Does it vary with time? We don't know. If dark energy gets sufficiently large, then there'll be a sort of runaway expansion so violent that it will lead to what has been dubbed the Big Rip, with atoms and subatomic particles being torn apart. And nicely, we could survive to watch it all apart from about the last thousandth of a second. Alternatively, the universe might eventually just stop expanding and collapse. The Big Crunch. Now that one would actually require the dark energy to eventually become negative. Now, comfortably, um, current observations suggest that both of these are equally unlikely, or at least are a very long way in the future. And probably most likely is that the universe will gradually expand, cool and darken. So, everything's hunky-dory, we understand the universe. Mm, not quite. Let's go back to that Planck cosmic microwave background data again. I've said that this standard model, this lambda cold dark matter model, is a startlingly good fit to the data. And it is. But have a look what's going on around here. Now these are large angular scales. But it's too high. It doesn't match the data here. So temperature fluctuation or scales of 6 degrees upwards are about 10% less than predicted. So we're too low here. Something is going on that we don't understand yet. Another issue is the value of the Hubble constant, h naught. Now the Planck data gives 67-ish for now, 67.4. And the similar value is obtained from a analysis in 2017 of the density of baryonic matter, normal matter. But from supernova and other stuff a long way off and CFID measurements for a long way off and from multiple lens quasars and various other time delay measurements we actually get a much higher value of around 73 and the errors on these are sufficiently small that they really don't overlap so the discrepancy between the Planck data, stuff at the very early times of the universe, cosmic microwave background, and stuff a bit more recent, is really quite large. Now, if this is true, it could imply that things were different in the early universe than they are now. And a recent result, 2019, suggests that dark energy may have been weaker in the past, which may uh, or may not help. And recently a study using red giant stars, the one in the middle, which have just started burning helium, gives a sort of intermediate result. So at the moment there's something going on here that we don't understand. Are oh, there any other bumps on the road? Yes, there are. Um, both of these are problematic. We don't know what dark energy is, and we don't know what dark matter is. Now, there is a basic theory for dark energy, this vacuum energy here. And a likely candidate will predict a dark energy that is 10 to the power of 120. That's 1 followed by 120 zeros too large. So our theoretical calculation of this produces a value that is vastly larger than that is which is observed. So obviously there's a problem there. 
Moving on to dark matter, there's lots of evidence for its existence, but none for what it consists of. And the usual candidate is some sort of particle dubbed a WIMP, that's a weakly interacting massive particle, and it's the sort of thing that the standard lambda cold dark matter model kind of assumes. And there are a number of experiments desperately looking for WIMPs, here's one of them. Uh, this is the Zenon 1T experiment at the Grand Sasso Laboratory, and this is underground, covered by one and a half kilometres of rock in Italy. And this contains three and a half tonnes of liquid xenon, hence its name, in a 10 metre water tank. You can get an impressive idea of the scale here by these chairs. And this is the most sensitive WIMP detector in the world. Uh, and recently, that's June this year, 2020, they reported and had detected an unexpected excess of events. Now, there's no definite source for these at present though the number detected is consistent with them being solar axions. Now in themselves, these solar axions aren't a dark matter candidate, but such particles in the early universe have been suggested as a possible source for dark matter. Currently, however, the experiment is being upgraded to a more sensitive version, and so we're simply going to have to wait. So, there you are. The standard lambda cold dark matter model mostly fits the cosmological data extremely well, but there are niggling issues that could overturn it. Anything else that might help? Yeah. With electromagnetic radiation, like light, we can only see as far back as 300,000 years after the Big Bang, because before that the universe was opaque. Okay, after 300,000 years, it had cooled enough to become transparent. So using electromagnetic radiation, that is as close to the Big Bang as we can look. Gravitational waves, however, which I'll talk about as the last talk in this series, next talk, don't suffer from this limitation, potentially letting us get back as far as the Big Bang. Now, none of our existing gravitational wave instruments are capable of detecting such waves. However, there is another way. Such primordial early gravitational waves affect the cosmic microwave background, in particular they affect its polarisation, sort of patterns of correlated polarisations referred to as the B modes. But the signal is very weak, and it's a very difficult observation attempts are being made. This is an experiment called BICEP, and that, that and its various successors might just possibly come up with something, but they're not there yet. We'll just need to wait and see. So there we have it. That's what we know, and that's what we don't know. I've mentioned gravitational waves. Tomorrow's talk will be looking at black holes and how they produce gravitational waves. So we'll see you then. Bye bye for now.